Buenas noches. Good night, everybody. Good to be with you tonight to share the word of the Lord. And at this time, I'm talking about the fatherhood principle as revealed in Scripture. Lord and Heavenly Father, this I ask of you. Lord and Heavenly Father, that this I ask of you. One day my enemies shall come to see that all the joy and glory resides in thee. I'm yeah. happy because in you I rest. And because I rest in you, I, I am blessed. blessed. So I'm taking this time to thank you from the bottom, from the bottom of, my of my heart. And hope, hope that like, unlike, unlike the Red, the Red Sea, sea we never part. Amen. Amen. Keep my light in the dark. Keep my warmth when I'm cold and when I'm feeling lonely. My Lord is there to console. Who are you to tell me that my God isn't real just because you haven't seen or felt how I feel? cold and when I'm feeling lonely the Lord is there to console bless his name all right Jesus in teaching his disciples to pray when they came asking him teach us to pray he said when you pray you must say our father who art in heaven I'm talking about the fatherhood principle as laid down in scripture in the, the case of Elijah, Elisha, and in some other cases that were not mentioned, Paul referred to Timothy as his son Timothy, but we knew that Paul was not married and Timothy was not his biological son, but there was some kind of a relationship there where Paul saw himself as a father figure in the life of Timothy. Earlier on when I started this discourse, I named about 14 different kinds of fathers and uh, you're going to have to go down through the list of stuff that I've done before to see what I was talking about and see if I know what I'm talking about. And so, Paul said you have many instructors 
but few fathers. What is he talking about? He's talking about the fatherhood principle. And I'm going to be examining it again tonight. And hopefully this will be my second to last time I'll be dealing with this subject. Yes, the word father, as used in the context of scripture, it means your source, where you go to, to get information, insight, revelation. Your source, the human being that gives you your insight. That person is the source of your understanding, the source of your spirituality, the source of your biblical insight. It doesn't matter that you go to a church. Sometimes you can go to a church for years and somebody can come along and in a week you learn more about God, Bible, church from that person than you learn for the years you've been sitting in that church. Why is that? It happens because there's a resonation that happens. Something in you says, that's the voice I'm supposed to be listening to at this point in my life. That's the voice I should hear. They're saying the kinds of things that you've been feeling all this time. Deep has been calling, but no deep has been answering. And finally, when this person comes along, whether he or she, that's picking a fight right there, because uh, women in the kingdom can be father figures too. So, oh no, come on, ref, come on. <laughs> There's no male or female in the kingdom, bro. You know that. Come on now. Don't let's get into a theological discourse. All right. They're the source of your spirituality. They answer your questions. They, when they say something and explain something, you say, why didn't I see that all the time? They make things click in your head. They, they just propel you, as it were, into destiny. So the Father is your source of spirituality. You are who you are because this individual has done a work in you. Sometimes they haven't been deliberately trying to do a work in you. They're just doing their work. But the Lord will say to you via his spirit that's in you, that's the voice I want you to hear. And some people fight it. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, oh, no, oh, no. And they lose out because the level of growth that should have happened, because when a father comes on the scene, there's a catapulting. You don't stay the same. Look, I was in the mall one time. My son, Kevin, those of you who know Kevin's story, he's not going to walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ray, Ray, Ray. So I used to have Kevin on top of my shoulder. I walk around the mall with him when we first came here to North America. Well, he was younger then. And so he'd be way up here, seven feet plus in the air because he's on my shoulder. A woman saw me one time, but she knew me in suit. I'm always preaching when she sees me. This is the first time she sees me. I'm in a t-shirt, jeans, and some kind of uh, boots or something on my foot. She said, Reverend Escaboom? <laughs> I said, yes, how are you doing? She said, you wearing jeans? I said, yes. She said, who's that fierce-skinned child on your head, on your shoulder? I said, that's my son. Don't you see he has my complexion? Look, we had a great laugh because, you know, he takes after my wife and so he's, he's very fair like his mother. So she's looking at me like, oh, okay, okay. And she laughed, I laughed, and she went her way. The point is, he is higher. He's in a position of elevation because I'm his father. I'm carrying him. He's not heavy to me. He was eight at that time. Or 10, somewhere thereabout. But because of the medical troubles that he faced from birth to whenever. Fathers cause their children to be elevated. They put them on their shoulder. If you have a spiritual son or daughter, they're supposed to be doing better than you. They're supposed to be understanding greater things than you. Elisha is supposed to do twice the miracles that you do. You can't have spiritual children. You want them to be less than you what kind of a father are you to not want your child to succeed massively because they have a launching pad to get further you are the launching pad oh you thought spiritual father i, I this guy is going around churches in the caribbean talking about this is my spiritual son he's owning all the young pastors who have come up and started churches then he'd go and tell them you have to give me 10 percent of everything that you get because i'm your spiritual father so he has a motive his motive is to, to suck them dry. That's his motive. 
His motive is not to promote them, not to propel them, not to push them, not to get them going further, faster, quicker. He's out to get a dollar-dollar bill, y'all. I'm not going to be addressing that anymore tonight. So your father is the source of your spirituality. Are you there? Now listen to Isaiah. Isaiah said, unto us a child is born. A. Unto us a son is given. B. And the government shall be on his shoulder. C. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, let me show you the progression. Unto us, a child is born. Say child. Child. All right. Secondly, from child, it moves to son. Unto us, a son is given. Then it moves from sonship to government being on his shoulder. You know a little child can't run a government. Well, we got some people that are running the government. Uh, uh, whatever. And then his name shall be called Everlasting Father. Child, son, running the government, everlasting father. Let me eliminate the government aspect of it. Child, son, father. Child, son, father. You're a child when you're born again. You have to first be a son. You're a child when you're born again. You come to church, you don't know anything about anything. You can't find John 3.16. People give you the Bible, you don't know where to find John. You're all over the place just... Ruffling, we all had that start. Eh? Yeah, we all were there. Didn't know what to do. Didn't know people call you brother. I told one man, I'm not your brother. He looked at me like, who is this heathen? <laughs> he smiled, I smiled. But I told him, play it. You, you're not my brother. Don't call me brother. Another guy put his arm around me and say, oh, my son. I said, wait, hold a minute. I know who my father is and it certainly is not you. I was fresh in the church and I couldn't understand their language. It was foreign to me. These people were like aliens. And they were looking at me like, hmm, E.T. phone home. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Let me get back to brass tacks now. The progression of a Christian life begins with birth. Child is born. Then son is given. The child has grown to a son. And then after sonship has been lived out, the child is promoted to fatherhood status. Are you feeling a brother? You're first a son. You're first a son. Out of court, in a court, holy of holies. Out of court, in a court, holy of holies. There's a progression. You're first a son. You start from the outside. Elisha recognized Elijah at the last possible minute. All the time he called him master, master, master. He wasn't getting no, no uh, mantle. But when he said father, the mantle dropped. But Elisha served Elijah first. Washed his hands. Yeah, yeah, re, re. Some people want to be a father and they haven't served anything. They were never a son. Look, you can't go from child to father. Where's the sonship aspect of it? Hello? Because you're going to reap what you sow. There are people who have served nobody. They have helped nobody. They oppose everything when they go to a church. They go on that board and they fight the pastor. You would think God sent them there to keep the pastor in line. And they fight and fight and block every program that you try to have. Everything they block. Every idea. They vote it down. They call up people on the phone and they get them to vote it down. You're going to get it back in abundance. I had this brother used to give me no ends of hell. No ends of hell. He was a cantankerous troublemaker when I flew out of the country and went off on... Uh, preaching assignment, he disciplined people, he put them out of the church, he shut the door on them, got them out in the rain, all kinds of stuff. When I came back, 26 people were gone from the church because this great guy has run them off because he's now in charge when I wasn't there. And uh, later on, he got himself a pastorate. Well, guess what? Yes, you guessed it. I'm not going to have to tell you. And he came to me crying, said, Pastor, you know, you got to come and talk to these people. said, to tell them what? What have you been doing to cause them to run off like that? Why is your assistant behaving in that manner? And uh, I was laughing on the inside, but I had to look serious and all deep man of godly on the outside. He was reaping what he sowed. The law is unalterable. You cannot plant banana and get cassava. You get what you sow. 
The only thing is you get it in abundance. You don't ever get back one mango. You get thousands of them when the season comes around. You will reap what you sow. You have to learn to serve as a son before you're elevated to fatherhood status. If you have not served anything and anybody, you will never be a good father because you don't know what fathers do. You have never exercised a role as a son. You don't know how you felt as a son because you were never a son. There are people that will go to churches for years and years and years and they avoid as much as possible to get involved in anything as far as possible and then they want to be in charge of something. No, that's not the way the Sankey is sung. Sankey no sing so, my Jamaican Adrian would say. You have to serve as a son to be elevated to fatherhood status. A child is born, a son is given, his name shall be called Everlasting Father. There is a progression. You do not lie down a blunder and get up a wonder. That's Essie Boom speak. Now, let me give you another sign. The person who is a father in your life, they see what's in you, even when you don't see it. And sometimes when they tell you, you get upset, you get angry. You, 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 oh, you're just trying to flatter me. <laughs> because the world is a toxic place. People are eight times more prone to insult as they are prone to see something positive in an individual and call it out what they have seen, the positive thing. They will more insult you eight times before they give you a word, of, a, a, a word that boosts your confidence one time. The world is toxic. It's a toxic place. But the Father will see what's in you. And they don't need to know you forever and a day. There are some places that I go to and I see people in the audience and I can hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, evangelist, prophetic. You know, based on the, the fivefold ministry gift, Yah Yah Re Re. And I'd call some of them and, and say to the pastor, you know this person? he say, yes. I said, this is who they are. And then... Many times, more than not, the pastors say, I've been telling them that now for the last two years. They wouldn't listen to me. Might as well you tell them because you don't know me. You don't know them. You have called it out. Can you, can you spend a two minutes with them and tell them who they are? And of course, I don't need him to give me a second encouragement. I will just dust set the Lord. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Most of the time they look at me like, who is this fool? Who does he think he's talking to? Somebody told him something. That's why he's coming here pretending like he heard from God. And they reject it. Nine out of ten times they reject it. They call you everything but a child of God. And sometimes somebody else has to come and tell them the same thing. And somebody else has to come. And when they get 57,090 confirmations, then they begin to move. By then they have an old walking stick. Their teeth have fallen out of their mouth. They're walking and drooling. They're barely good for themselves. Now they want to give all of their strength to the Lord when they have nothing but husk left. You don't wait for 57,900 confirmations. <laughs> my point is the father sees what's in you there are so many places that you see greatness greatness and you wonder why it's not being exercised and many times it's because the people that are in charge are intimidated by the gift that they see in other people and so they squash it quick they keep it at bay you ain't nothing. I'm in charge. I run this ship. You sit your little tail down and until I tell you to pray, you don't even pray. Until I tell you I'm the man of God. <laughs> They're scared of their own shadow. Father, see what's in you. Paul saw something in Timothy. Even though Timothy was a half-breed. Uh, in some places they said Dougla, Dougla, cosmopolitan, mixed. He had another bloodstream flowing in his father's bloodstream. He was Greek and another uh, persuasion running through his veins. And so he was suspect in that time in the church. And then here comes Paul talking about, you're going to be, you know, uh, let no man despise thy youth. Be an example to the believer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Poor Timothy was a nervous type of person. He was not bold. He was timid. He just wanted to stay in a corner. And here is Paul telling him, you were not born to be in a corner. Come out of your cave. <laughs> and Timothy came out and he was going to be an exceptional minister of the gospel in the time to come. Planting churches with Paul and choosing leaders and deacons in the church. That was Timothy's job after Paul was jailed for preaching the gospel. Father, see what's in you. That's just one aspect of it. 
The second thing is they bring it out. They expose you to things that you don't think you can do. They expose you. When I say expose, I'm not talking about a negative connotation here. I'm saying they, they make sure that they introduce you to people that, that are told, this is who this person is. When you need a person of this nature, this is who you call. Sometimes I get invitations to go out and speak, and I tell them, I'm not the best man for that job, but I do know this other guy over here. I do know this gal over here. She is the cat's meow and the dog's bow wow. And they say, well, if it's coming from you, they got to be the cat's meow. And, and I never got a bad report on any person that I said, this is who they are. People will call and say, man, you didn't tell me the half of it. Why you lie to me? <laughs> because they went out there and on the strength of a word that introduced them to that audience, they performed like who they really were. Some people just need a break, for God's sake. Give people a break. Don't try to break them into pieces. Give them a break. Oh, so many gifted people in the church with nothing to do because the pastor is afraid of his own shadow. If you say, boo, he wet his pants or whoever it is that's in charge. Give people a break. Let them flow. Let their light so shine before men. Fathers see what's in you, eh? And they bring it out. They bring it out of you. They, they give you a book that they see that you would need to read this particular thing because there's something in there that they know would be good for you. They send you a tape, a DVD. They introduce you to somebody. Whenever people come to a church that I'm the pastor of, I'll tell them, there are some people that I will introduce you to. Stick to them. And one person had the nerve to ask me, so what about those who you don't introduce me to? I said, stick to the ones I introduce you to. I was giving them a message because no church is perfect and every church has some cantankerous people and if you introduce new people to cantankerous people, guess what happens? You've got a new cantankerous person on your hands. So you have to be strategic in your introduction of the people. You don't introduce them to everybody. You introduce them to the good people. So some of that goodness will rub off on them until they learn the culture of the church. And then by their own self, they will decide who they're going to be tight with and who they're going to be staying away from. That's your job to do that, Rev. Don't let them be introduced to everybody. Have you lost your mind? If you have a gossip in the house and you introduce a new person to a gossip, if that new person is a gossip, guess what? Now you've got two gossips to deal with. So be strategic in your introduction. Don't introduce them to everybody. Don't say we welcome this person to our local church. No. Introduce them to the strategic good people who are spiritual. So some of that spirituality can rub off. Father, see what's in you. And secondly, they bring it out. Yeah, they bring it out. They point you out. Look. Jesus is arguably the most powerful of everything that ever came on the planet. And yet when it was time to begin his ministry, John said, Behold the Lamb of God. What was he doing? He was bringing him out. Who take it away the sin of the world. Notice in the movie with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, there's a movie that uh, he was going out of the door and uh, Rambo, Sylvester Stallone was walking in and he tapped him on the hand and walk right out. What was he doing? He was saying, it's your time to take over the action movie scene. And he did take over and did a good job. Even in the secular world, they point out people that they're bringing up next. Look at Jay-Z, not my favorite person, but ever so often he's bringing out new talent, new talent, new talent. I'm not promoting that, but I'm just saying that in the world system, they bring out new people. Costa Amato brought out Tyson. Who have you brought out since you're in ministry? Not a soul. Why is that? You're picking up other people's children and putting your name on them. <laughs> you're a rustler. You're not a father. John said, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. The latter, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. I'm not even worthy to unlock his shoes. Now, John was the baddest thing in the planet at that time. Jesus said, of all the men born of women, John the Baptist is the greatest of all prophets. And this man who is arguably, by Jesus' definition, the greatest of all prophets, is pointing Jesus out and saying to the audience that came to hear him, "This I'm not even worthy to lose this man's lesson. Guess what happens there? They are switching right now from John to Jesus. He must increase, but I must decrease. That's what fathers do. They're willing to hand over 
to their children who are coming up. That's what Elijah did. I will drop the mantle if you see me as I go and you can go do what I do. Go part the Jordan like I parted the Jordan. Do double the miracles that I did. Why isn't the church producing people of a greater dimension than those who claim to be fathers of the church? Because they are not fathering anybody. The fathers have eaten green mango and the children teeth are on edge. Mm-hmm. Jesus went to John and John introduced him. John brought him out. John turned the spotlight from him, John, onto Jesus. John was saying to the audience of thousands around him, I know you guys came to me here for years in the wilderness, but now you're going to stop coming to me. This is the new kid on the block. He's taking over from me. I am not even worthy to, to untie his shoelace. People said to themselves, well, if John was this powerful and he's telling us he's not even worthy of this, this guy has to be something else. And he was something else. John was right. When the baptism was done, the dove came from heaven. Shumba came on Jesus and he went off to be led by the Spirit into the wilderness. John was going to unlock the power. As powerful as Jesus was, he needed an unlocking. He needed a father figure, John, to say, the lasses of his shoes are not worthy to unloose. Who have you unlocked? Who has unlocked you? You jump and run to do ministry. Nobody knows you. Know <laughs> you printed your cards and went out there. Who unlocked the gift that was in you? Who pointed you out? Who said this is who this is? You? Self-promoting? Self-promotion? That's not going to cut it in kingdom business. You need a father. Fathers raise sons. That's my third point. Fathers raise sons. Like I was telling you about my son, Kevin. I put him on my shoulder. I was raising him. Literally, up to sit so he didn't have to deal with all the audience that was around. It was Christmas time. Lots of, you know, traffic, people running, jolting. And then with his uh, problem that he had then, he needed a father to raise him up. Who have you raised? And he could see farther than me because he's up there. He's in an elevated position. Your sons are supposed to see farther than you, fathers. They're supposed to preach better than you, fathers. They're supposed to do better than you, fathers. They should have greater vision than you, fathers, because they come with what they have, and you give them what you have, so they, are, they have twice the advantage. You are supposed to put your sons in a position of advantage if you're a father. All you want to do is rebuke them all the time, rebuke them, cuss them off all the time, make them feel like dirt all the time. What's up with that? They can do nothing without me. They can't even pray a prayer. Let me show you how to pray. Well, when are they going to learn if they don't pray? Let them make their mistakes. Come on, y'all. Hey. Fathers raise son. Elijah did two times more of what Elisha did. Because he was raised up and given the mantle. Ay, 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 ay. All right. Sons now, let me talk to the sons. And when I say sonship, I'm talking about daughters too. Sons, that's, you know, no, in Christ there's neither male nor female. I'm not going to argue that point. Women shouldn't preach in the church uh, because Paul said the woman should be silent. Uh, none of that stuff. We're not flowing in that stream. That water is too dirty to be messing with. Sons replicate their father. Sons replicate. They, they are an original photocopy. <laughs> oh, glory to God. When Elisha smote the rivers of Jordan and the waters parted, the sons of the prophets by fifties, 150 of them said, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. They could see him moving with the same level of power that Elijah moved in. Why? Sons replicate their fathers. Sons dress like their fathers. When Elijah was Lifted up by the whirlwind. His mantle, his outer belt-like object that he wore across his waist. Elisha tore his clothes and threw them away and picked up the mantle of Elijah. He was going to wear that, dressed like his daddy who had just left. How does your spiritual father dress? Modestly. How do you dress? With your pants sagging down your non-existent derriere. You're not replicating anybody. How does your father go to church? Early. How do you go? Ten minutes late. You're not replicating your father. You're constantly absent. Your father has never missed the house of God before. You're not replicating your father. Oh, I'm not hearing nobody say nothing now. I can hear a mice licking ice. 
sons replicate their father, sons dress like their father. All this shabby, see through stuff, panty line exposed, leg, breast, and tie showing in the house of God. You don't have a father. That's why you dress like a hoochie mama. You don't have a father. There's too much flesh on parade in the house of God. And ladies, you need to know men are visual. What they see, they will want. Oh no, they're, they're men of God. <laughs> have you been smoking weed? They are men. The of God part, we're going to deal with that later. But they are men. And men are visual. What their eyes see, they will begin to want. And that's you. With your legs split all the way up, all the way up. All breasts hanging all the way up. Everything exposed. You're going to give an answer to God for the manner in which you dress. And for the amount of men who, instead of paying attention to, the, to whatever, they're lusting after you. Because you dress to excite. You dress to entice. You don't dress moderately. Your moderation is not known. You don't have a father. That's why you're behaving like that. Somebody to tell you, girl, that thing is too tight. Girl, you're showing too much. No, 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 no. It no goes so. No, no, no. Come on now. No. Too much breast hanging out there. That's one of the reasons I don't like to go to Christian weddings. Because 99% of them backslide on the wedding day. Everything is out on the door. What are you trying to do? What are you selling? Come on, y'all. I dislike Christian weddings for that. Always half nakedness all over the place. Everybody's half naked. Even the mothers in Zion half naked. You got milk? <laughs> all right, all right. Sons just like their father. They look like their father. They sung like their father. They sung like their father. They sung like their father. They're not trying to be different, trying to, oh, I'm going to cut out uh, my own carving, my niche over here. I don't want anybody to think that I sung like, no. The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. Peter sung it like Jesus so good after his years as a fisherman who could cuss bad word that the girl said, your speech betray you. You sung like him. He had the song. What song? The Jesus kind of song. Simon the rough fisherman sung it like Jesus after being with Jesus for just three years. They said to him, your speech betray you. Even when you cuss, the cuss don't sound so stink coming out of your mouth. You, you have a sanctified cuss. There's no such thing. You, you cuss like a Christian because you, you're not setting your mouth right. Your face doesn't say that you know how to cuss. You have been with Jesus. That's why you can't cuss properly. He couldn't even cuss. Peter could not even cuss. When you got people in church and they can cuss, you know it's not Jesus they follow. <laughs> Woo-wee! Son sung like their father. Song like their father. When people hear you, they must hear your father in you. I'm talking to the sons now. The highest level of flattery is imitation. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. When I stop following Christ, follow Christ. But follow me as long as I'm following Christ, follow me. Do what I do in my following of Christ. How many pastors can say that? How many father figures can say, follow me as I follow Christ? I had this guy he came and convinced everybody and their mother that he, I'm Pastor S. Boom's son in the Lord. The first giveaway to them was he comes late to church, 10, 15 minutes late. So they asked him, say, how come you claim to be this man's son in the faith and you always late and he never late? He always early. He's always half an hour, one hour early. You always late. What kind of son are you? He couldn't answer. They look at me, I look at them. They shook their head like, he's not your son. And, um, I'm not going to tell you what I did. <laughs> the highest level of flattery is imitation. Follow me as I follow Christ. All right. Uh, let, me, let me show you a principle here in Scripture. The Father God said, draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh to you. What did I miss? How come you're saying that? What does that mean? What does that have to do with Father. Listen to what God the Father said. Now notice where the onus is. Notice where the responsibility is. Notice who moves first. Draw nigh to me, and I will draw nigh to you. Who makes the first move? The person who draws nigh to God the Father, and then God the Father draws nigh to them. 
What am I talking about? I'm talking about sons now. Sons, it is your responsibility to pick a father, figure out where your spiritual source is, and draw near. How? Think. Use your brain. I'm not going to tell you that one. Draw near, and then they will draw near to you. The father's job is not to run around looking for sons. The son's job is to draw near. So people who are running around claiming all these people, I want you to be my spiritual this, I want you to be my spiritual that, they are fishing. They have done a pretty lousy job in their own house, and so they go around finding somebody else's house who has raised their children right, and they want those children to be claimed as their own because they don't have the spunk, the guts, the spark, the initiative to raise a son of their own so they have to go and try to bastardize somebody else's children to make them their own child. Their children are in discipline, out of order, and so they find somebody's child who is in order and has spiritual discipline, and they want to claim them as a son. Will you be my spiritual child? That's not the way it works. The son must draw near to the father, and then the father goes after the son. The father doesn't go running looking for children. The children must know they need a father and go find yourself a good one. Mm. Now listen to the danger now of gifted sons. Because in this day and time, we will have young men with old men's wisdom. Listen to me good. In this day, 2018 and beyond, we are going to have young men, young women... With all men's wisdom, they will not take 40 years like we took to know what we know. Time is crunched now. Everything is praised now. Everything is shook now. And the world doesn't have 40 years for you to become what you have to become. So you're going to have to get there sooner than at once and quicker than immediately. And therefore, God is going to bring that spirit of revelation that causes them to have information that took you 20 years to get. Now, don't be jealous of that. Listen to me good. Because even though they have revelation, let me give you a case in point. Here's a young boy, Samuel. He's in the temple. He's a little teenager. He's lying fast asleep. Samuel. He looks around. He sits up on the bed. He doesn't know what's going on. Samuel. He looks around again. He runs out to Eli. He said, you call me. Eli said, no, go back to sleep. He goes back to sleep. Samuel. You know how Hollywood does it. Every time God calls a deep bass kind of voice. Yeah, yeah, Ray, Ray. He comes to Eli a second time. And Eli says, the next time you hear the voice calling you, you must say, speak, Lord, for thy servant hear it. Ah. Even though this young boy was having a supernatural encounter with an almighty God who knew him, found him, called him by name twice, and when he missed it the first time, called him again, and when he missed it the second time, called him again. God was chasing this young man, giving him insight, giving him revelation, but he did not know what he was encountering. Ah, here comes Father Figure Samuel, Eli, sorry, and tells him what to do. The next time that voice calls, say, speak, Lord, for thy servant hear it. They are going to have old men's wisdom, but they are going to need your guidance because they haven't walked this way before. They are going to have a whole lot of information, a whole lot of insight, a whole lot of this and that, but they need somebody to get them through the parameters, get them through the barbed wires, get them across the explosive, the minefield that they are walking, get them away from certain ministries that are going to prostitute them, get them away from that church that's big and that's inviting them and will rob them blind. Get them away from that little woman over there who calls herself a prophetess, but she's going to lie to them and try to get them in bed to sleep with her. Get them away because you know the ropes. You have been, look, we bear in our body the mark. You're not fooling us no more. We know a shyster, a con when we see one. We know good people when we see one too. And that's the role that we play in guiding them so that they avoid the pitfalls that we fell into. The messy situation that took us years to get out from. They'll be able to avoid all of that. And so they can have accelerated progress. They can get there faster. But I'm still saying, and I will maintain it ad nauseum, the generation that's coming 
There are going to be 12 talking like 40. You're going to have to say, where does child learn all this stuff? Haven't you come into contact with some children? You have to scratch your, your chin and say, this child has been here before. Haven't you met them? <laughs> you want to know how they know that. They're so small. Where they got that kind of wisdom from? That's the age in which we live. And so the boy Samuel needed Eli to educate him as to what to say next, what to do next. Yes and yes, that's the father's job, to guide your brilliant sons because they're coming up brilliant, brilliant. You, <laughs> you better do some studying just to keep up with the thing that they are forgetting. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Finally, and this is no uh, self-serving kind of stuff I'm saying here. Finally, as a citizen of, oh, Canada, my home and native land, as a citizen of, dear land of Guyana, of rivers and plains, made rich by the sunshine and loved by the rain, Said gem like and fair between mountains and seas, your children salute you, dear land of the free. You pay taxes in those two places, in the country that you're a citizen of. If you're a citizen of whatever country, you don't pay taxes in Japan. Sila, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything else on that. I'm going to just leave that hanging out there. And for those who have old men's wisdom, they're going to figure it out after a while. And some people, they have already figured it out. Like, oh, so that's what that is. That's okay. Yes. Yes. The electric company requires that for you to keep getting their light, uh-huh, uh-huh. Some people want all the light you have, but they're not connected to the company. They just stay on the periphery and snatch good stuff and run away with it and come back and snatch some more good stuff and run away with it. <laughs> all right, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that the spirit of revelation, counsel, and might will permeate the houses, the homes, the places where people are listening to this message and for them that will join later on to watch. <sighs> let the mighty power hey, of the great God Jehovah work through them and grant that they will have sonship and be elevated into fatherhood status. To the glory of God I have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night everybody. The boom is out. God bless. This young lady came to church one day, and as soon as she came in, the Lord said she can sing. And I told her, you can sing. And she said, no, I don't sing. I said, yes, you can. Come on up here and take this microphone. These are some songs that she wrote and put the music to. I saw it in her. <laughs> Hallelujah, I praise your name. I don't know if it's a choice to praise, but when you get a taste of his mercy, then you'll proclaim he's the king of kings, Lord of lords. Conquering lion of my soul. Yes, Mr. James, you got that right. You knocked it out of the park. How are you doing, big guy? Hallelujah, praise the Lord.